Well, thank you um, for the invitation to speak um, and uh, welcome to, to all the, the new first years. I hope you're enjoying Welcome Week. I hope you're um, going to enjoy classes when they start next week. Uh, my name is Anthony Phillips. I'm from the Condensed Matter and Materials Group. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own work on uh, making functional materials which are in some way disordered. Uh, actually, I realised that I, I came to, to put this talk into slides that uh, a lot of the stuff from my own work that I wanted to talk about gets quite technical, so I've left it till the end. Um, and uh, until that, I'm going to sort of tell some stories about uh, where all this comes from uh, historically and, and scientifically. Uh, I should just say, uh, just in case anybody is thinking of taking notes, please, please don't, don't worry. Uh, this is not supposed to be serious. This is not supposed to be a, a lecture. This is supposed to be uh, some interesting stories about science. So here we go. Uh, I'm actually going to start with a, a really fundamental question, which is, do atoms really exist? And of course, I, I hope most of you will agree that the answer is yes. Uh, but about 100 years ago, maybe a bit longer, the, the turn of the, the, um, the 19th to the 20th century, uh, it really wasn't quite as obvious as that. Um, chemists certainly said yes. Uh, there was this idea of, of what was called the law of definite proportions. Uh, so sometimes you could get the same reactants to react under different circumstances. For instance, you could burn iron in limited oxygen versus iron in excess oxygen. Uh, and they found out that uh, when you did that, the, the ratio of the oxygen that was taken up by the iron was always the same ratio. It was always two to three. Uh, and that was quite difficult to explain unless you said that you know, there were some sort of small particles that we might call atoms, uh, of which for every two that went in the first time, three went in the second time. Um, so chemists were quite on board, as you might expect, with the idea of atoms, um, but physicists weren't so sure. Uh, you may have seen a diagram like this before. This is, of course, the uh, michelson morley interferometer, uh, which was the device that was used to prove that the ether, this mysterious substance uh, through which electrical mag uh, electromagnetic waves were supposed to travel, didn't in fact exist. Uh, and so physicists were quite used to the idea that uh, we could have these, these nice physical models, mathematical models uh, to represent physical reality that didn't have to be literally true. We could uh, think of, of electromagnetic radiation as a wave without there actually literally being an ether that it travels through. So perhaps matter behaves as if it was made of atoms, but atoms themselves maybe, maybe were just a, a convenient mathematical trick. Maybe they weren't actually real. Einstein had an answer. Um, so this is uh, work he, he did, in fact, um, but b before the, the stuff he's really famous for, the photoelectric effect and, and relativity. Um, this is about uh, Brownian motion of, of particles uh, in a still fluid. Um, it's a simulation here on the right, and the yellow um, dot there is just following one particular particle as it, as it moves around. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, a, my yellow particle in the simulation is something like a grain of pollen uh, and all the black dots uh, buzzing around are things like atoms, uh, sorry, things like mole molecules in solution. Uh, and we can't see the individual molecules under a microscope, of course, but if you look at pollen in water, for instance, uh, under a microscope, you can see the pollen grains moving around the place uh, and they follow these weird sort of random walks, um, what's called Brownian motion. Uh, and the explanation that Einstein came up with that, which is correct, um, is that because uh, at any given moment, the atoms are going to bounce perhaps more off one side of the, the pollen grain than the other, just by random chance, uh, that's going to create a, a force in one particular direction. And so the pollen is going to wander around because it's buffeted um, by, all these, by all these molecules. So it's sort of indirect evidence um, for the existence of atoms, even though we can't see the atoms directly. Which is very nice, um, but again, we'd like to be able to see them uh, with our own eyes. And that came um, with the work of this fellow, uh, Max von Lowe, um, who won the, the Nobel Prize in 1914 for his discovery of the diffraction of X-rays by crystals. Uh, so he realised that if crystals, uh, if, if atoms were real, they should be packed together around about 10 to the minus 10 metres apart in crystals. Uh, and he hypothesized that actually we could use those crystals as diffraction gratings. Uh, you may have seen lasers go through a diffraction grating. Uh, they're just a, a regular uh, set of, of, of lines etched into, into some, some slide. Um, and if you shine a laser through the grating, then you get uh, a regular set of dots 
um, produced by diffraction. Uh, dots of, of laser light. So we thought you could do something similar with these mysterious rays um, called called Röntgen rays in Germany, or called X rays. Uh, and he managed to get a diffraction pattern. Uh, so in the top right hand corner here, you can see that uh, I mean it's a very very uh, blurry picture by today's standards, um, but you can see that there are these individual spots formed when he shines uh, X rays in his crystal and exposes a photographic film to him. And actually, he used that to demonstrate what X-rays were. Nobody was quite sure what this mysterious form of radiation was, um, but the fact that they diffracted from crystals and the fact that if atoms were real, they had to be about the, the right uh, about 10 to the minus 10 meters apart um, in those crystals meant that he could show that X-rays had to be radiation with wavelength about 10 to the minus 10 meters. Uh, but in fact, um, it was soon realized that actually running the experiment, if you like, the opposite way around logically, it was even more powerful. Um, so rather than using diffraction from crystals to explain what X-rays were, um, we could diffract X-rays from crystals to work out what the crystals were. Um, and that's what these father and son team, William and Lawrence, Bra Lawrence Bragg did, and they got the, the Nobel the very next year. Um, let me go back a slide and just uh, tell you exactly what I mean by a crystal. I'm going to come back to this in a moment, but uh, the, the, the key characteristic, the key that makes it behave like a diffraction grating um, is you have the same sort of arrangement of atoms. Uh, you can see if I've got um, green and red repeating here over and over and over again, repeating in the X, Y and Z directions all the way through, um, through the crystal. In other words, large enough to make a macroscopic object. And it's that repetition, that symmetry, uh, that meant that this diffraction was possible. And we'll come back to that idea in a moment. Um, anyway, so here's some some more diffraction patterns. Uh, you can see these these spots were a little bit less blurry by by the time that, uh, that these two got involved. Uh, and this is a comparison between the experimental. Uh, this is a photograph. This is literally a photographic plate exposed to X-rays, um, and the theory uh, of how those spots might behave here. And you can see that if you sort of rotate the the pattern at the top a little bit, it, it matches up with the one at the bottom. Um, just because I've been showing you these horrible blurry old pictures, let me uh, jump ahead a little bit uh, and show you some of my own data that's collected. This is actually neutron diffraction data um, collected on the Koala instrument uh, at the Australian Centre for Neutron Scattering, which names all of its instruments after Australian native animals. Um, and you can see that uh, with, with modern uh, detectors uh, and modern equipment, uh, I'm using a crystal much, much smaller than uh, than the Braggs or than Von Lowy used. Uh, and yet I'm getting these beautiful sharp diffraction spots uh, you can see that if I wanted to measure the position or the intensity of any one of these spots, yeah, you know, they're, they're all beautifully separated and well defined. I can I can measure them all separately quite nicely, and of course that's exactly what I wanted to do in this particular experiment. Um, so we moved um, from crystals. Um, the, the, these these two were looking at um, at mineral crystals, which were the the, the crystals that were big enough um, to to diffract reasonably weak x-ray beams from um but by the time we got to the 60s and this is dorothy hodgkin who, who won the nobel prize um uh, by this time she was she was looking at uh, biochemical structures so uh, one of her famous examples was uh, vitamin b12 um and so we were moving from naturally grown crystals that can be quite big uh, to to artificially grown crystals that you might grow in a lab that were only millimeters or, or less in size uh and were able to tell where the atoms are by this relationship, um, this diffraction relationship uh, that that happens when you when you shine X-rays in a crystal, um, and this is the sort of, of structure that we get out of biological X-ray diffraction data these days. So this is a tremendously complicated protein structure. So I haven't even shown the individual atoms here. Um, for instance, these helices here are, are uh, particular arrangements of amino acids that are joined together into the into the protein. Um, so this is a this is a very very large scale structure. There are thousands and thousands of atoms here, uh, and yet we can still use the basic same technique to discover the structure. Uh, so, X-ray diffraction diffraction methods in general have been tremendously powerful uh, in determining the structure of materials, uh, and they're they're incredibly important. Uh, I want to take a, a little step back now, though, and ask why should atoms pack together? into crystals in the first place. And the simple answer really is just that 
every atom is the same as every other atom. If 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 my red atom here is is happy being above one red atom, below one red atom, next to a black, next to a black, then well this one over here is also going to be happy being in the same environment. And so is this one. And so is every red atom in the in the crystal. So it, it makes sense that that you should get the same sort of pattern repeating over and over again um, if if each atom behaves the same. Um, so here's a really simple example. This is this is um, uh, a generic sort of curve for the energy of attraction between two atoms. Uh, and you can see if you push them really close together, they don't particularly like that because the nuclei are both positive charged and, and, and the energy goes off to infinity because um, you know, Coulomb says you can't put two positive charges together happily. Um, and if you pull them a long way apart, uh, then the energy goes to zero. Of course, there's no interaction at all. Um, and in between, there's some sort of distance where they're, they're really quite happy to be together. There's an energetic minimum. Uh, and in fact, this idea was was first um, first looked at by Kepler, um, who's now, I guess, more famous as an astronomer. Um, he had things like Kepler's laws of of, um, of planetary motion, um, but he also wrote this this treatise uh, called "On the Six Angled Snowflake," um, and he was he was thinking about the structure of snowflakes, and he he looked at them under a microscope and realised they were they were six sided, um, and he he thought about packing spheres together, and he discovered. Uh, he, he wrote down, obviously people had known this before, but he, 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 he wrote down that uh, if you pack spheres together as tightly as possible, uh, you get this nice sort of hexagonal pattern forming. Uh, and that's not uh, a hexagonal pattern that's been imposed externally. Uh, and it's not there's some hidden hexagon inside a sphere. It's just a geometric fact of two dimensional space, really, um, that if you, if you put spheres together on a plane, then they, the, the closest way to pack them together is in these nice hexagonal structures. Uh, and in fact, that's, you know, that, that's obviously true, but it, that is the basis for many packings of atoms as well. Uh, we want atoms to be close together. They all want to be at that, that nice uh, stable equilibrium distance from their nearest neighbors. Uh, and if you do that, you get much the same structures as, as Kepler's talking about here. Um, and so this is an example um, of a sort of symmetry uh, which is important, um, which is a very important concept uh, in, in looking at crystal structures. Um, so actually, uh, let, let me say a few more words about what sorts of symmetry are and aren't possible. Um, and this leads to a, a different story, which is a bit of a sidetrack, but it's such a good story, I, I can't resist telling you. Um, so I've got at the top some some uh, packing of, of some uh, simple polygons, um, regular polygons. So a equilateral triangle packs very nicely to fill the plane. Uh, a square packs nicely to fill the plane. A hexagon packs nicely to fill the plane. Uh, if I try and do this with a pentagon, I can't do it. Uh, there is no arrangement of pentagons which tiles the plane. That's a, a sort of mathematical fact of, of geometry. Uh, and so what that means actually um, is that this sort of threefold, three corners symmetry and fourfold symmetry here and sixfold symmetry are all very, very common to see in a crystal structure. Uh, and the pentagon is not. So uh, it was therefore a, a, a tremendous surprise uh, to a certain bunch of, of, of scientists in the 70s um, to start discovering crystals which looked like that, which have beautiful uh, pentagonal faces on this icosahedral crystal, um, or indeed diffraction patterns. This is a, an electron diffraction pattern. Um, that looks like this. If you count the points there, you see you have a beautiful 10 pointed star. Uh, and this was a tremendous uh, surprise and a blow to the scientists who discovered it um, because it, it was it was thought that, that such a thing was geometrically impossible. Um, if we, we understand how crystals work, we thought, um, because of the same thing repeating over and over again. Uh, and the same thing repeating over and over and over and again gives you threefold and fourfold and sixfold symmetry, but never fivefold. So what's actually going on? Um, so this is the guy who, who did it, um, Dan Schechtman, uh, and he also won the Nobel Prize for it, um, for, for discovering what are now known as quasi-crystals. Um, he wrote down in his, his lab book at the time, he, he st stuck in this diffraction pattern and wrote, in Chaya Kazot, there is no such creature, um, because he was so so confused that there um, that there could be some, some five-pointed diffraction pattern. So what's the answer? Um, it turns out actually to be related to what are called the Penrose tilings. Um, actually, if you've been on campus, you might have seen these on the side of the Maths Building of Queen Mary. Um, but the Penrose tilings are named after Sir Roger Penrose, uh, and they're a, a setting of tiles that, that tile the plane, but that never actually 
repeat themselves. So I can continue this pattern indefinitely out to tell the plane, but I can never actually translate it, move it so that uh, um, so that it ends up in a position that's equivalent to where it started. In other words, if I take two copies of this uh, and move one with respect to the other, they'll never line up again unless they're, they're where they started. Um, that's a little bit difficult to describe uh, in words. Let me show you what that looks like in pictures. Uh, so here it is. I've taken uh, taken two copies of the, the Penrose tilings here, and I've put one on top of each other uh, in, in various orientations. And you can see when I do that, some of them line up, but some of them don't. You can see these, these dark bits are actually where there, there isn't any line up. And in fact, uh, no matter how you um, no matter how you arrange your your atoms and uh, sorry arrange your patterns with respect to one another, um, you you never get the uh, you, you never get them lining up with each other. In other words, there is no long range translational symmetry, um, unlike what I've been referring to as a crystal. So how do we get this? I mean, I, I started out with this idea that atoms like to be uh, in similar sorts of situations. So if one atom ha happy being in a particular environment, the next atom will be happy being in the same environment. Um, actually, it turns out that there are local rules that can be obeyed to generate this, this sort of quasi-crystalline pattern. Um, so here's an example. On the left here, we have uh, the two sorts of tiles that, that uh, make the Penrose patterns. Uh, and it turns out that if you want to, to tile these together to make the Penrose patterns, all you have to do is make sure that the, the red lines and the green lines line up whenever you put them together. So actually, I couldn't put these two tiles together like this because the, the red lines wouldn't line up here. But all of these combinations here on the right are possible ways of arranging tiles together at a vertex. So you can see we can have local matching rules. In other words, each atom just has to look at where it is with respect to the next one um, and is it happy with that or not. And rather than leading to something which is, is long range translationally ordered, that can lead to something that's quasi-crystalline, that has this, this five-fold symmetry um, that packs together nicely, but where there, there, is, there is no long range translational order. Uh, in fact, it turns out that, um, that these, these patterns have been known for a long time before uh, Sir Roger Penrose des uh, described them. Um, so here's an example um, from, from Girich Tarling uh, in the, the Green Mosque in, in Bursa in Turkey. Um, and you can see we have a beautiful 10 pointed star here like the um, like the 10, 10 fold diffraction pattern and it's a pattern that involves lots of pentagons. Um, so these um, the, the, these these patterns have been been known for a very long time, uh, but it's uh, again just like Kepler and his his uh, his spheres actually being arrangements of atoms, uh, it's remarkable that these particular geometric patterns also turn out to be the arrangement of atoms in, in particular solids. So the story gets even actually weirder than that, um, because the, the beautiful icosahedral crystal I showed you before um, is a, an artificial sample, it's a man-made sample. Um, and at the time that was uh, the, the original work was being done, um, the only samples known were in fact artificial. But since then, naturally occurring quasi-crystals have been found. Um, this is an example. It's a, uh, a mineral called uh, khatirkite, which I can't pronounce very well. Um, and it's found in the, in the Korak Mountains in, in the far, uh, far, let me get this right, the far east of Russia. Um, and, and this is a naturally occurring quasi-crystal, which is nice. Uh, but uh, in fact, by, by investigation of the, the surroundings it was found in, uh, the ge geoscientists, uh, geochemists and geophysicists think that actually this wasn't a, a naturally occurring mineral on Earth. Rather, it came from a, a meteor strike. So actually, we have this really bizarre and to my knowledge unexplained uh, situation where we have this, this mysterious form of almost crystalline packing called quasi-crystals. Quasi um, and the only naturally occurring examples known on Earth probably origi originated from an extraterrestrial source, um, which is interesting and bizarre and, and uh, has, has, has sparked quite a lot of interest in actually just what sort of conditions would have to have, uh, have, have been in whatever star um, this, this bizarre mineral originated from. Uh, anyway, that was kind of a digression. Um, let me let me return to this idea of symmetry um, because symmetry is important. And I want to explain a little bit about why. 
Um, let's just look at the word for a bit. Um, symmetry is, is, is from the Greek symmetria, um, meaning sin plus metron uh, measure together. It's, it's bits that measure the same. Uh, in the scientific sense, what it means is that I can do some sort of geometric transformation to whatever I'm looking at uh, and, and I get back what I started with. So in the case of a, a spiral like this shell, if I zoom in the right amount, then I'll get a spiral that looks like what I started with. Here we've got rotational symmetry. If I, I take this petal and rotate round by a fifth of a turn, um, I get more or less what I started with. That's a, uh, We've already seen rotational symmetry in this talk. Um, this is an example of translational symmetry, which we've also talked about. Um, if you move over a little bit, you end up with something that looks like very much like where you started. Uh, and of course, here the Taj Mahal um, has beautiful reflectional symmetry. Uh, if I take the left hand side, uh, it looks very much like the right hand side. And in fact, in this beautiful photograph, if I take the top, it looks very much like the bottom. So different geometrical transformations which leave my object looking unchanged. Another way of thinking about this actually is that an object has symmetry if I can cover up some of it. And if you can predict by looking at some of it, what the rest is going to look like. So this leaf, for instance, we say is symmetrical because I've covered up one side and you could tell what it was going to look like just by reflection of the other side. Uh, on the other hand, an object where it isn't possible um, is not symmetrical. So this is an example of an object, uh, a cat that uh, lacks reflection and symmetry. So there is a sense in which symmetry is kind of the opposite of information. Um, if you have an object which is symmetrical, like this fence, I can translate by a certain amount and get something that looks very much like what I started from. Then just given one single picket of this fence, I can predict what the entire fence is gonna look like. On the other hand, if I have an arrangement like this where, where uh, my, my toothpicks are different colors unpredictably, I can't start from here and predict what the next one is going to look like. I don't know what the arrangement of colors is going to be. Uh, so conversely, I could invent some sort of code where uh, you know, a green toothpick means A and red followed by yellow means B. Uh, and I could encode information using this system because it's not symmetrical. Whereas on the left hand side, uh, because the system is so symmetrical, there is a limit to the amount of information that can be associated with the system. Uh, and in fact, uh, symmetry is, is really quite intimately linked to some very fundamental properties of physics. Uh, because, as you'll know, uh, the laws of physics are symmetrical with respect to translation in space. In other words, uh, if I do an experiment here, or if I go to France and do the experiment there, or if I go to Pluto and do the experiment there, uh, the same laws of physics ought to hold. They're symmetrical with respect to rotation in space. If I face north or face south, they should be, I, could, I should get the same results. And they're, they're symmetrical with respect to translation in time. Uh, if I do an experiment today and do the same experiment tomorrow, I should get the same answers. I don't expect the laws of physics to have changed from one day to the next. Uh, and it turns out that, that those three statements are very precisely mathematically linked to the fundamental conservation principles that you, you know and, and, and love, or know at least. Um, translation in space is linked to the conservation of linear momentum. Rotation in space is linked to the conservation of angular momentum and translation in time is linked to the conservation of energy. Um, and in fact, if you uh, if you remember your quantum theory, uh, <coughs> you may recognize these pairs of variables as pairs that are related by the Heisenberg uncertainty relationship. So translation, uh, translation as an X position and linear momentum as an X momentum uh, are a pair of quantities that you can't measure precisely uh, at the same time, same with time and energy. Uh, this goes very, very deep into to the heart of theoretical physics. I'm not going to explore that any further, but it's a, it's a nice connection. Um, these these rules um, are the work of Emmy Neuter, uh, who was uh, one of the greatest mathematical physicists of the, the early 20th century. Uh, in fact, she, she's got an interesting story. Rather, rather infuriatingly, she's she, she's both a mathematician and a physicist. Um, and she is very, very famous in both fields for completely different reasons. Um, so in fact, her her physics work that I'm, I'm talking about here, these these connections between uh, co uh, sym symmetries and conservation laws uh, was early work that she did relatively early in her career. Uh, and she later moved on to some, some pure maths and, and achieved some, some very fundamental seminal results there as well. Um, so yes, quite an incredible person. 
Um, okay, quick question for you. Uh, and I'm sorry, because of the way I'm set up, I'm, I'm not set up to do this as a poll. So I'm just going to ask you to, to make your choice. Um, given all we've talked about with, with, with symmetry, uh, I've got here two different states of water. I've got liquid water on the left and, uh, and solid water, ice on the right. I want you to decide which of these on the atomic level is more symmetrical. So just take uh, a moment or two and think of what your choice is going to be. Uh, and the, 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 the answer, well, the tempting answer, the thing, the thing you might be inclined to say is, oh, look, the snowflake is so beautiful, it's so symmetrical, it has to be the, the, um, the solid state. Uh, but actually, if you think about it, water is even more symmetrical in the sense we've discussed than than ice, uh, because there are more geometric transformations we can do. There are more things we can do to end up looking the same as where we started. So, for instance, we talked about rotation. If I sit here in the middle of my, my snowflake and look along this, this axis, I can turn 60 degrees or 120 degrees or 180 and so forth and end up looking in the same direction, uh, 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 equivalent direction. But if I sit in the middle of water and look in some direction, I can rotate by any angle and it always looks the same. So actually this has less symmetry than this does. And the process of water freezing is an example of what's called spontaneous symmetry breaking, symmetry reduction. Um, <clears throat> and again, this is a very, very deep concept in physics that I don't have nearly time to go into here. Um, but we have this sort of tension between uh, hot conditions, if the temperature is high, that we tend to be in high symmetry phases like water. Um, as we've said, high symmetry is associated maybe with low information. And therefore, what's important actually is entropy, this tendency towards disorder. Um, don't worry too much about the technical definition of entropy. You'll come to that uh, in due course in your studies, but uh, for now, entropy is a, a thermodynamic property that's associated with disorder. Uh, on the other hand, as we cool things down, we tend to go to lower symmetry phases, which therefore have the opportunity for higher information content, uh, and energy becomes the most important driving factor. Right, okay, so I've, I've told you an awful lot so far, um, and I just wanted to pause here and, and try and uh, recap some of the strands um, before, before the final stretch. So I said that atoms and molecules often pack together in arrangements with long range translational symmetry, like crystals, that's the, the top diagram here. And sometimes because of the sorts of uh, local packing rules we talked about, they pack in arrangements with no translational symmetry, and that's quasi crystals like the, the Penrose tiling on the right. Uh, the final thing I want to talk about then is the fact that the atoms sometimes pack in such a way that the translational symmetry is only there on average. And the trouble with averages is that it can be very misleading. Uh, so as a hypothetical example, consider my, my goat here. So I'm imagining that you're, you're, you're watching the behavior of a goat over time and you, you photograph it. Uh, the first photograph, it's facing to the right. The second photograph, it's facing to the left. Fine, that all makes sense. If now you decide, well, I, what I want to know is on average, how does this goat spend its time? and naively average those two pictures, we end up with something impossible. So this is a, a medieval monster called an Amphispina um, from a, a medieval manuscript in the British Library. Uh, so I mean, I'm, I'm being slightly facetious here, of course, but the point is that by taking two perfectly good snapshots and taking an inappropriate average, actually I end up with something which is impossible. And exactly the same can be true of crystal and atomic structures. Um, so to illustrate this point, I'm going to talk about probably the most famous X-ray diffraction photograph of all time, which is photograph 51, uh, taken by Rosalind Franklin at King's. Um, and this was the, the X-ray photograph uh, that demonstrated that DNA had a double helix structure, which is an absolutely seminal discovery that uh, famously Crick and Watson won the Nobel Prize for, and, and very sadly, Franklin um, had, had already died uh, ovarian cancer by that stage. Um, but yeah, um, here, here is that, that photograph, here she is, um, here's her model of DNA, and here's a sort of modern version of the same thing. Now, obviously there is some element of translational symmetry here, there's some element of the long range order that gives these diffraction patterns, because you can see the diffraction spots here. <clears throat> but, 
if you think about it, you, 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 you realise that DNA can't be a perfect crystal because if it were, it would be a bit like my white picket fence. I could just see one strand and know what the next would be and the next and the next and the next. In other words, I might have, if it were a perfect crystal, uh, you know, there are there are four bases which are used as a sort of genetic code. So my, my, my crystal might go ACTG, ACTG, ACTG. Great, but I can't encode a protein that way. The way to have information is to be of lower symmetry. So although on average this thing is symmetrical and I can I can go one twist up the double helix and end up somewhere that looks very much like where I started. In fact, the actual sequence of bases along DNA is not symmetrical because uh, because it encodes information. Uh, and so not only the average beautiful double helix structure is important, but also the local deviations from that average, the particular code that enables DNA to do what it does. And it's that conflict between an average structure and a local deviation from that average that my own work is based on. So in this last little section, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some of the things that, that you can do with this order. Um, here's an example from um, my former student, Jashin Liu, when I first presented this, um, she was soon to be doctor, but she's, she's now successfully graduated, so she's now Dr. Liu. Um, and this is an example called uh, a material called cesium lead iodide. Uh, hopefully this structure on the, the right looks somewhat familiar to you because it's the same structure I've been using to illustrate what a crystal looks like all through this talk. Um, but you can see that the big difference is now I have shown the structure as it actually is with, with thermal motion taken into account. And you can see that the beautiful, uh, simple structure where, where a single pattern is repeated over and over is actually only a, an average. You can see if you, if you look at what's actually going on, there's a lot of disorder. Um, atoms are moving here and there. These, these octahedra are not perfect octahedra. Um, there, there is there is a difference between this iteration of the pattern and this iteration and that iteration. So the material um, is is interesting, particularly actually for its so its optoelectronic opto properties as nanoparticles. Um, so here it is, cesium lead iodide, but you can replace the iodide by bromide or chloride, um, which are smaller halogen ions, uh, just the same column in the periodic table, um, and by by choosing your composition wisely, you can get nanoparticles that uh, that luminesce in any colour of the rainbow, as this, this rather pretty picture shows. Um, and so these things are quite quite interesting um, for various sorts of, of electronic displays and, and, and light emission and sensing for that matter. Um, and so what Jashun did um, actually is look at the, what's called the anharmonicity uh, in the lead to iodide bonds that allow this, this material to have its useful and unusual properties. Um, so this is a histogram of what's going on at very various different temperatures, just the distance between lead and iodine. Um, remember, on average, this distance is just a constant, just a number. But by looking beyond the average, we have a whole distribution. Um, and you, you will have heard of, of, I think, the harmonic potential. Perhaps uh, you may have heard of simple harmonic motion. It's sort of the, the sim simplest possible um, uh, vibrational model, I guess, for, for two, two balls joined by a spring or two atoms bonded to one another. Um, and so this dotted line, this dash dotted line is what you would get if you assume the lead iodine bond is harmonic. And actually this uh, solid line, which is quite different at lots of lots of um, distances where there really are pairs of atoms, uh, is what's really going on. So by looking beyond that average, beyond this, this simple harmonic structure, um, Justin was able to, to see how these bonds really behave and hence to explain uh, where the optoelectronic properties of this material came from. Okay, another uh, interesting application of symmetry breaking, it's for information storage. Um, so this is a uh, another material in the same family, you recognize this octahedron of atoms. Um, let's say, for example, this is, this is a slight simplification of what actually happens, but let's say that uh, this atom in the center uh, is unstable there and can either move up or can move down. So that breaks, for instance, the mirror plane symmetry across the middle of this octahedron. Um, if that's the case, I can treat every occurrence of this atom as a, a binary bit. And I can say up means one, down means zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, zero. I'm, I'm suddenly storing information. Uh, and in fact, that's exactly what's going on inside a PlayStation. Um, it's what's called ferroelectric RAM. Um, 
just to clarify, I should I should say I, I didn't personally design the the uh, the memory of, of uh, PlayStations, um, sadly, but I uh, I do work on materials that have the same properties, and I'm I'm trying to find better ways of, of doing the same thing. Um, so it's 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 back to this idea of, of symmetry being the opposite of information. If I can get uh, disordered materials, maybe on average these these central green atoms are in the center, but actually locally they're either up or down. That I can use that symmetry breaking to store information. Um, you can use the same idea actually to scavenge energy. Um, so these are a couple of examples. This one's um, from from a metro station in Japan, and this is a demo outside King's Cross Station um, here in London uh, of of trying to harness the energy from people just walking through turnstiles at the at the, at the the exit of a tube um, in order to to generate electricity. Uh, and it turns out you can do this in in much the same way. I'm not going to go into the detail, details, but um, if these materials are asymmetric in an appropriate way, um, then compressing them, putting them under strain, gives rise to an electric field, which can be used to generate electricity. Uh, and so this is a really interesting and promising way of of trying to reclaim waste electricity and make make um, make things more energy efficient. You don't get an enormous amount of electricity out of this. So I, I should hasten to add. Um, but the idea is basically just to to, to get enough. Um, so there are plenty of, for instance, remote sensors that you might use in, in, in scientific uh, exploration. Um, for instance, supposing we're trying to monitor pollution or CO2 levels in a city and stick a sensor right at the top of a tall building, um, it's going to be a pain in the neck to uh, to climb out there every six months and change the battery. So if a sensor like that can simply get enough scavenge enough energy from its environment to do what it needs to do and send a signal back to base that's good enough um so yeah, collecting small amounts of waste energy from the environment that might be from for instance vibrations from people standing on them um is a, a useful and productive thing to do and we're hoping to develop materials to do that uh what else this is an example of, of um, symmetry breaking in a particular atom so it, it turns out a lot of materials um including the iodides i talked about, talked about before um have this uh, have interesting properties because the lead iron actually turns out to be somewhat asymmetrical for rather obscure quantum reasons. I'll, I'll leave those till later. Um, but unfortunately, lead of course is toxic. Um, so there's there's quite a lot of interest in trying to to generate the same sort of symmetry breaking, but from something that is less toxic. Um, so I, I experiment with uh, putting in organic molecules like this. You can see this is uh, the, the shape of the lead electron distribution is kind of squashed and elongated in one direction. Um, and so this is a kind of squashed molecule, which is, is different in, in this direction. Um, and you have some success in, in, in using non-toxic molecules to cause the same sorts of symmetry break and hence the same sort of properties um, as toxic lead metal. Uh, right, I'm going to skip this because I'm running out of time. Uh, this is what I'm working on at the moment, um, just to say that uh, entropy, this idea of disorder, um, is also the basis of thermal cooling cycles, um, in particular, the, the basis of the refrigeration cycle that uh, every sort of cooling from your fridge to your, your MRI machine in the hospital is based on. Um, unfortunately, the cooling cycles that uh, are currently used are based on gases, which are both greenhouse gases and ozone depleters, so they're not really very environmentally friendly. Um, so actually a big part of my research at the moment is trying to get solid state materials that in the same way can be cycled between a low entropy phase and a high entropy phase. In other words, a, disord sorry, a disordered phase and a more crystalline phase. Um, and by cycling between those two phases, we can use them to pump uh, heat in the same way as as with vapor compression, refrigeration, but in a more environmentally friendly way. Good. So all of that was was very quick. Um, don't worry too much about the details. Or feel free to ask about them if you like. Um, but just as an example of uh, some practical applications of these rather abstruse theoretical ideas. Where next? Um, so I just wanted to to finish off kind of where I started. Um, I started by by reviewing the history of diffraction and I said that we applied it first to minerals or first first of all to understand what x-rays were then to understand what minerals were then to understand what biological materials were uh, it's now absolutely ubiquitous in in all sorts of science including on Mars so this is a, a picture of the, the Mars rover uh, a selfie indeed taken by the Mars rover um, and this is an example of uh, some of the places it's been visiting this is a place on Mars that's been dubbed uh, rock nest 
Uh, and I think the two pictures there are, I'm sorry, I can't remember the difference between them. I think it's during a sandstorm versus not, but um, I, I can't remember. Um, anyway, the, 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 this is the um, this is the, the surface of Mars. Uh, and it would be really nice to know what these minerals actually are. You know, what is that sand made of? What are these rocks? You know, what, what is Martian geology like? Fortunately, the Mars rover actually has a diffractometer, has an X-ray machine on board it, and it has a robot that can shovel up the the uh, the sand and feed it into the diffractometer um, automatically. Um, so I'm just going to finish with this, which is the first diffraction pattern collected on another planet. Um, we've got rings here rather than spots. That's because we're looking at a powder. If you like, we're looking at, at, at lots of crystals at once. So lots of spots all along this circle add up to a, a ring. Um, but this is a, a usable and interpretable diffraction pattern, um, and, and this was, was reported back by the Mars rover and, and used to understand the mineralogy of the surface of Mars. So, where does that all leave us? Uh, matter is sometimes crystalline, it's sometimes not. Uh, we can use diffraction methods to analyse crystals, but uh, we need to be careful because they show us averages only, and actually the deviations from that average are also a really powerful sort of materials functionality. I'll leave it there. Questions? Hi there. Yeah, that was uh, that was really interesting. Thank you very much for doing that. So we're going to uh, ask any of you guys to, uh, if you have any questions, if you did prepare any questions about that now, uh, you can post them in the comments section uh, on the right hand side and we'll read them out or uh, Anthony Phillips can read them. Um, you can also uh, unmute yourself and then speak into it. I think that works. Yeah, if you want to so unmute, you wanna unmute yourself to ask, ask a question, please go ahead. Um, until well, then, uh, I've got some. Uh, I've got some prepared. So, uh, my first question I thought I'd ask you. Um, I know that your research at the moment uh, you use lots of neutron diffraction, um, and I was just wondering mm. if you tell us about the experimental side of what you do, uh, just quickly. Yeah, of course. Um, so, yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I do do a lot of um, neutron diffraction as well as X-rays. Um, so often that involves travel to to uh, to where the the um, their central facilities are like the the koala data I showed. Unfortunately, obviously, uh, we we can't do that now. So, I, in fact, I have a, a sample on koala right now, but unfortunately, I'm here in London rather than in Sydney with the sample. Um, so, neutrons um, are kind of difficult to make um, because obviously, free neutrons are not found in nature. There are basically only two ways of doing it: either you use a, a nuclear reactor. Um, or you use what's called a spallation source, um, which is where you fire actually a proton beam at a metal um, and with enough energy, it sort of knocks neutrons out of the nucleus and gives you a, a neutron beam. Um, so obviously both of those things are kind of expensive, difficult things to set up. It's not like we are able to have one in our own laboratory. That used not to be the case, by the way. So Queen Mary, until the 60s, had its own nuclear reactor, which was, was lovely. Um, I, mean, I wasn't there at the time, but it must have been lovely for the, the physicists who were working on it. Um, but sadly, now uh, you know, we're not allowed to have our own nuclear, our own nuclear reactor. Um, so we have to travel to, to central facilities. Um, the UK's national neutron source is at the Rutherford Appleton Lab, um, just on the sort of outskirts of Oxfordshire. And I under normal circumstances, go there several times a year to do experiments. Again, unfortunately, at the moment, I just have to post samples and hope for the best. Um, but there's also, so that's a spallation source. Um, but then there's the the European source, which is a, a nuclear reactor called the uh, Institut La Langevin in uh, Grenoble in, in France. That's Lauer as in von Lauer as in Max von Lauer, um, Nobel Prize 14. Um, yeah, so there are these facilities around the world um, and you you basically write into them and say, this is what I'd like to do with your neutron beam. Could I have some time, please? Uh, and then there's a panel, which in fact, I, I, I am a member of the ISIS panel. That's the UK's panel. Um, so I uh, the panel gets a whole, whole list of proposals and they decide which ones sound the most interesting and the most likely to lead to good science. And they say, fine, you can have two days on this instrument. Um, and then... So we, you make your sample and you, you take your team to the, the, the beam line. And then for those two days, the, the instrument is yours and you collect as much data as you possibly can. And then you go home and spend the next six months trying to analyze it. Brilliant. Um, another question on that. Anyone else who has a question, feel free to bump in or put it in the chat. 
Uh, a question I had, um, since you teach Introduction to Scientific Computing in Year 2, could you tell us some more about um, how, uh, what kind of coding students are expected to do while they're at Queen Mary uh, in first and second years, and how code and coding programming is useful as a scientist, uh, and how do you, you use coding uh, in your in your career? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess so. That there are there are lots of ways to to use computers, um, but what's what's common in in scientific research is that there there often isn't a way to to do exactly what you want because what you want hasn't been tried before. Um, it's it's very common. You've got a new sort of data, you need to try a new sort of analysis. Uh, therefore, rather than relying on an existing program, you need to code your own. Um, so. What we what we try and do is is prepare you for that um, over the course of your degree in, in your first year um, as part of the general skills course, the professional skills course, um, you learn some some very basic Python programming. It's just a, a real easy introduction to the language. Um, in second year, if you like, there's the introduction to scientific computing module, um, which I'm actually being run by by Dr. Agnor this this year, um, but I'm I'm the the associate for it, so you'll see me there if you. Oh, sorry, second years will see me there if you do that. Um, and that is an introduction to to algorithms. So it's not just how literally how to program a computer. It's also what you might want to program it to do. What what is what a computer is good at? What a computer is bad at? How to tell the difference? How to present your problem in such a way that a computer can solve it or can help you solve it? Um, and, and from then on, uh, I, I, there there. there well, there's a little bit of, of stuff in the curriculum. There, there is the, the computational condensed matter course in third year, which unfortunately we're not running this year, but in general there is. Um, and there, there are some fourth year options to do with computing as well. Um, but then, of course, there are the, the third and fourth year projects. Um, and so it's very common if you're doing a project with any sort of theoretical basis or any sort of data analysis um, to, to have to, to write some code as part of that. Um, so what would I say? Um, <coughs> about about how coding is used it's it's it's, it's a difficult subject i mean it, it, it in, in the sense that it just it's it's a new way of thought um it's something that some people take to a lot easier than others uh and that doesn't really have often anything to do with you know how good you are at maths or how good you are at physics or anything else um so i guess my, my main advice with coding is you know, if, if, you've, if you've never done any before, don't worry, we will teach you from scratch. And if you, you try and find it really difficult, um, again, don't worry, persevere, um, because at, at some point there will be a sort of a switch that flicks and and and, and you, will, you will find it a lot more natural. Um, I think a lot of people, I think a, a lot of people try it you know, once or twice <laughs> and see that some people take to it very quickly and get a bit scared by that and think, oh, if, if I haven't reacted that way, then then I'm not going to be any good at it at all. And in my experience, that really isn't true. So don't be scared. Brilliant. And um, does anyone else have any questions on the uh, the lecture that um, Dr. Phillips just did or uh, on any other questions uh, in general, really? Um, Stand them all into silence. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, with the coding, yeah. you referenced that we would learn Python in first year. Yeah. At any point, would we be transferring over C++ or would we finish using Python as our primary language? Uh, up to you. Um, so the, the first and second year modules are in, in Python. Um, the, let me get this right. At the moment, there aren't any taught modules in C++, but certainly most of the particle physics projects are in C++. Okay. Um, so if you end up doing a project with particle physicists, you will you will almost certainly do it in C++. Um, if you do something in condensed matter, then it may actually be Fortran or it may be Python. Um, you know, different different fields use different languages, mainly because that's what the legacy codes are written in. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about the differences, though, because uh, I mean they are different. But once you've learned a first computing language, learning a second is is a lot lot easier. So, thank you.
Um, and also, I might just add to that, um, in second and third year, you can do modules from other schools. And I know that there, oh, that's are, true, true. Yeah. there are modules, certainly with the School of um, Electronic Engineering and Computer Science, they have uh, C++ modules. So if you really wanted to do that, you could do that. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, you would call it. We've, we've had traffic in both directions, actually. We've had several physics students go there to do C++, and we've had some of their students come here to do Python. So, um, yeah. Uh, I've got a question in the chat. Um, no, live lectures are going to be on Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, is there a limit to how much non-symmetry can store information? Uh, good question. Uh, yes, there is. But actually, at the moment, we're nowhere near that limit. We're much we're, we're limited by our technology rather than a sort of fundamental limit. I mean, I drew this you know, pretty picture where I said, hey, you know, the atom here could be up, the atom next door could be down, the atom here could be up. Well, that's great. But unfortunately, there isn't a technology at the moment that can move an individual atom up and the next one down and and, and, and faithfully store information that way. And even if there were, there isn't a technology that could read it back. Um, so at the moment, we're still... Hmm. Let me get the order of magnitude right. Uh, I think we're probably looking at millions of atoms in every bit of information. Um, and of course, in, in fact, before we before we get too much smaller, we're going to need to worry about things like quantum fluctuations. Um, there's no good storing information if quantum theory means it's it's sort of indeterminate how we read it back. So yes, there is a fundamental limit in terms of symmetry. Um, but I think actually both technology and the sort of physical limitations of the quantum world will get in the way first, if that makes any sense. Um, how do you access Blackboard Collaborate on QM Plus? Um, there is a link from each modules page. So I, I realize, and I'm, I'm sorry about this, I think there were some last minute glitches. Um, not every module is visible right now. I, I promise they all will be soon. Or not that I have anything to do with it. I'm told they all will be soon. Um, but uh, you know, certainly by next week when classes, classes start, um, but there'll be very, very clear links from the QM Plus site. So it's not like you need to go to a separate site. Um, everything you need for a module should be on its QM Plus page. Okay, uh, I will ask a question. Uh, and if you have another question, please go ahead in the chat or whatever. Um, you started uh, your university journey in the University of Sydney, I believe, studying, oh, it chem is. Yes. studying chemistry. I wanted That's to right, know yeah. what it was that uh, made you decide to choose uh, physics, the better science. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess the first the first thing to say is is that the Australian system is a little bit more general than the UK system. So, I mean, yes, I, I did chemistry in the sense that my, um, I guess, the equivalent of my fourth year master's project. It was it was formerly bachelor's, but it was it was the equivalent of what you do for masters. Um, so the, the my fourth year project was in a chemistry lab, um, but I had done you, know, you, you do more subjects up to third year level in australia so I, I, I was doing chemistry and physics and pure maths um so it's not like i you know was not a physicist at all um but i sort of fell fell sideways really into physics i mean i ended up coming to the uk to, to do i was looking at phd um positions in in both chemistry and physics um and the one that i ended up uh falling for and deciding to go and do was was in physics and i've been in physics ever since um i think it's to be honest, there's a very, very sort of porous boundary between the subjects um, at solid state chemistry and condensed matter physics are, are very, very close to one another. Um, and I think there are benefits, you know, whichever side of the, the line you, you find yourself on um, to knowing a little bit about the other. I mean, you, you want to know about the fundamental physical laws that govern uh, the, the way atoms pack together, the way mole molecules pack together, you know, what physical properties you can expect from materials. Um, and equally speaking, you want to know about how you can actually make those materials in real life, of course. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very glad to have ended up where I am, but I, I um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say I turned away from chemistry. I just, just found a found a comfortable position to do physics and chemistry at once. I mean, for that matter, and and maths, you know, as 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 you will know, the, it's it's a very um it's a very mathematical, it's a very geometric subject as well. So I, I sort of get to combine all of my my intellectual uh, loves in one subject. Okay. Thank you very much. I don't think we see any more questions coming through. If there are, please please do post any questions that you have in the chat. Um, but if not, oh, there we go. Uh, how do you information from powder diffraction? Powder diffraction depends. Uh, good question. Um, 
very briefly, uh, you, you, you want to add up around all those circles so you get sort of peaks at particular distances. Um, and you can relate, relate that back um, to, to the symmetry of the cell and then eventually to where the atoms are. Um, it's yeah, you know, that's kind of a subject in, in its own right, and in fact, it's it's part of what I teach in, in second year condensed matter. Um, but it's um, what am I going to say? The, the the interesting thing actually is that so much information is lost. Um, so the the signal, the diffraction signal, um, is a wave which is a complex number, um, but you only detect the amplitude. So you've thrown away the phase. So we've already thrown away lots of information there. Um, and because it's a powder, we've got lots of crystals um, in every possible orientation at once. We've also lost all the orientational information about which, which way the crystal is pointing uh, in a way that we wouldn't if we only had a single crystal. Um, so yeah, we, we, have, we have much less information from those patterns than ideally we'd like. Um, and there are lots of really quite clever mathematical tricks we play to try and reconstruct what we've lost. Uh, and in fact, I think we're able to to do a lot better than you might expect um sort of naively just looking at the problem um, we're able to reconstruct really quite precisely what the what the crystal structures are okay uh right so i'm gonna wrap up but if anyone adds a question then we can fit that in yeah. um so otherwise uh thank you uh dr and phillips i thank you all have a good welcome the boomerang above your head. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's not deliberate. I should check my background more, more, more carefully. Anything else? I don't want students to see behind me. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much for delivering that lecture as well. Yeah, that was you. very fascinating. Very, very grateful for that.